My name is Dave Leatherman, and I, uh, I guess my first statement is that I'm not a doctor. Uh, I'm, uh, I have a master's degree. I, I functioned for uh, 32 years as the forest entomologist for the Colorado State Forest Service, and that was based here in Fort Collins, Colorado. And my job was to back up our um, agency personnel with issues related to tree insects and I traveled widely over the state and the dominant issue for my getting a job in the first place and throughout my career was the mountain pine beetle and um, so I'm happy to talk to you all about it and I think it's an issue that probably at least periodically is a big deal in all three states represented by the teachers here and um, so I'm going to go through this presentation it's a uh, mostly dealing with biology uh, just so that you have an understanding of how this beetle works and why it tends to rise up from time to time and kill a lot of trees and create dead trees which um, as I understand it, the focus of your uh, group is to look at ways that we could use those trees uh, in the energy field and not just uh, have them sit out there as dead things that, um, I mean, they would eventually be useful to the ecology of the site, of course, but um, I think if we could figure out a way to have our cake, at two, cake and eat it too with uh, these dead trees, that's a good thing. And um, so I'm going to proceed through this. I'm hoping the sound is okay and everybody can hear this and see the screen. And uh, let's see, what do I got to do to is advance this around? thing? It doesn't do anything. Oh, okay. Well, let's get rid of that and see. If... Okay. Just... So I'm going to start very very basic. I learned talking to homeowners that I shouldn't assume anything uh, and the first thing I want everybody to realize is that trees are alive and they die um, of things and that's okay. That's the way it's supposed to be and in this part of the world the two things that or the, the things that are the most likely in to the life of a tree, a native tree up in the mountains, uh, are fire, mountain pine beetle, mistletoe, uh, humans, of course, and uh, I'd say the typical life span of a lot of these conifers that we have in the West is 100 to 150 years. Um, I always say that uh, people that work in our part of the West in the biological sciences are all underpaid because administrators know that we're not going to go anywhere because it's such a an interesting place to be and one of the main reasons for that is the diversity that we have and a lot of the diversity is attached to our elevational uh, range and in all three states that we're talking about here we've got plains, uh, short grass prairies or steppes and we go up to uh, considerable heights in the mountains um, upwards of 12, 13, 14,000 feet and that kind of diversity leads to plant diversity which leads to animal diversity and is why they can underpay us. Um, the role of, of pine trees and fire is interwoven all through the story of the pine beetle and humans have come on the scene and um, made our mark on the landscape which oftentimes is at odds with uh, what fire would like to do uh, arguably should do to the landscape and so 
Uh, these forests are very much influenced by what we do in the way of fire prevention, uh, what fires are allowed to burn or, or um, circumvent our, our attempts to stop them. And that definitely influences the, the forest in a way that um, definitely drives mountain pine beetle. And I always say that Smokey Bear is the best friend. Uh, my, I call my little model beetle that I carry around to schools uh, Buford, and uh, Buford's best friend is Smokey the Bear, because to the extent that Smokey puts out um, puts out these fires, uh, that leaves more trees for the beetle, and. Uh, I think the homogenous nature of, of a lot of western forest areas is because fire has been taken out of those ecosystems and not allowed to kill patches here and there and create uh, a diversity. And so when that homogenous forest uh, gets old, old enough, stressed enough for pine beetle, then pine beetle gets a bigger share of the forest than it might have had had Smokey not influenced it. Um, I'm going to real briefly talk about this uh, plant dwarf mistletoe, or actually it's a group of plants, and uh, they are parasites, uh, parasitic plants. So these plants live on another plant, pine trees, and in some cases other kinds of conifers and they divert from those trees to themselves nutrients and water and they definitely stress these the infected trees and sometimes um, the stress could lead to a pine beetle attack there's been a lot of studies of the relationship between mistletoe and pine beetles and Frankly, the uh, results of those studies are quite mixed. In some cases, it looks like mistletoe, the presence of mistletoe in a pine stand excludes mountain pine beetle, and in other cases, it looks like it definitely leads to or results in stress that that is conducive to attack. So it's, um, I don't think the relationship between this these parasitic plants and the pine beetle on pine trees is uh, really all that clear, but they're very interesting plants. They they have um, forcibly discharged seeds. They shoot out in late summer under water pressure, and uh, they're sticky, and they can sometimes go long distances and from the infected tree and land on another tree and cause a new infection, and that's the way the mistletoe spreads. Uh, usually, sometimes that explosion occurs uh, when a bird lands in a clump of mistletoe and is fussing around in the clump and that triggers the discharge of these seeds, the seeds stick on the feathers and the bird flies across the valley and cleans itself or preens over on the other side and maybe the bird is responsible for long distance spread and uh, in some cases they've even found uh, red squirrels have done this same kind of long distance transport. So. It's a very interesting plant and uh, uh, creates, it usually doesn't kill its host, it's what they call a smart parasite. Um, occasionally it plus another factor like drought can lead to death, but so I've included it as one of the ways that trees die in the Rocky Mountains besides fire and beetles. Uh, the mountain pine beetle is in a group of beetles that we call the bark beetles and they're called bark beetles because they go through the bark and live just underneath the bark in an area we call the inner bark or the cambium region, the phloem region. Um, I always compare a tree to an Oreo cookie and if you think of one dark cookie as the bark and the other dark cookie is the wood, the good stuff in the middle, the white layer is sort of like the phloem layer. That's where the tree stores the products of its photosynthesis. A lot of the sugars 
uh, are stored there and it's highly nutritious and a lot of things over time have figured that out. Um, porcupines have figured it out, pine beetles figured it out, some of the Native Americans figured it out and peeled live pine trees and, and stripped off that foam layer and dried it and made flour out of it. So uh, it's a, a very action-packed area of the tree um, and the pine beetle is probably the number one example of a creature that's learned how to exploit that layer and this uh, going through the bark business I tell the story about going to schools and talking about the pine beetle and my friend Buford and the best part of going to an elementary school classroom at least is two weeks later when you get the package in the mail of letters from the kids thanking you for coming to their school and I tell the story of the little girl that drew a picture of Buford on the side of the tree and out of his mouth is the little language uh, circle and in the circle are the words bark 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 and this little girl thought that he was a bark beetle because he made noises like a dog and I'm thinking I failed in my attempts to uh, educate these kids but uh, so I want none of you to think they're bark beetles because they make those kind of noises although they do make noises we'll talk about later um, about 90 percent of the tree mortality in the United States is from this group of insects and the pine beetles probably the one of the two most important of the group and uh, of all the insect cause mortality, 60% of that is, is to this group. So uh, you can see they're important. And, you know, on average, a million trees a year are dying, um, or 10 million trees um, are dying every year in the West since we've been keeping records. So that's a lot of trees. Um, the the ecological role of the pine beetle essentially is to turn a forest over. You know, an old forest has to come to an end and a new one has to start. And oftentimes an epidemic of this insect is is that event or what ecologists call a disturbance. And that's a good thing. I mean, the forest needs to be rejuvenated and um, it's like we've said if it's just when humans put their designs on the planet that oftentimes is crossways with what the beetle wants to do and therefore the beetle is often viewed as the enemy or as a bad thing and um, the beetle is not good or bad it just is and it's just doing what it does and I think our best way of looking at it is that we should figure out how to coexist with it um, and not there to be eliminated or uh, totally circumvented in every case. I think we should allow them to do their thing to the extent we can and live with them, uh, maybe moderate their impacts when we can't tolerate uh, their designs on the forest completely. Um, but these epidemics of bark beetles are cyclic, like a lot of things in the forest, and um, a lot of people can live for decades in the forest and never see a pine beetle, and then when it does come, they come in spades, and it seems like there's something wrong with the universe. All of a sudden, everything was nice, and then one year later, the trees are turning red and dying, and oh my gosh. And um, I think part of what I hope you get out of this is that they are natural and to the extent that you know I think where where we maybe have the right to uh, intercede and manage them and and um, moderate their impacts is to the extent that we humans have um, intensified what they naturally would have done and I think fire suppression is a good example um, 
so traits of this group, um, this scolite, scolitony, uh, that's a subfamily of the weevils that includes these bark beetles. And uh, some interesting facts about this group is that they all have uh, a symbiotic or mutualistic relationship with various uh, fungi that they bring into the trees. Um, they develop in the phloem. A few of them will actually live in the the wood proper, the xylem. Um, most of them are very limited in the kinds of trees that they can attack. This species of bark beetle attacks that species of pine tree. Um, they usually restrict their attacks to a particular portion of the tree, the trunk, a branch, or the twig. And a lot of them are what ecologists, at least in the old days, ecologists would refer to them as keystone species. That is, there's, they seem to be kind of special in terms of the number of interconnections that they have with other organisms in the forest. I mean, everything is sort of connected to everything else, but when you think about bark beetles killing large numbers of trees and all the uh, organisms that would depend on on getting their start, I mean there has to be a dead tree for them to get started. All the birds that nest in cavities, all the fungi that decay wood, um, all the breakdown creatures, uh, roly polies and bacteria and yeast, and um, they all carpenter ants, they all need dead trees to do their their particular uh, thing in the ecology of the forest. And the mountain pine beetle is kind of setting the table for a lot of other organisms. Uh, the subject of bark beetles and, and the symbiotic or mutualistic fungi that they are associated with is pretty interesting and I don't think the final chapter has been written yet. Um, uh, this picture shows the, the cut ends of logs infested by two different kinds of bark beetles. On the right you can see those kind of pie wedges or those big wide lines of dark gray kind of going toward the center which seem to end at the darker pink wood in the middle which is the heartwood. Um, these fungi don't do that well in heartwood but they do very well in the other xylem tissue. and um, that on the right is typical of mountain pine beetle and some of the other uh, related species of bark beetles that live under the phloem in the phloem layer. Uh, that log on the left shows some distinct lines that run into the center of the wood, and those are a particular subset of bark beetles called ambrosia beetles. And ambrosia beetles live in the wood and actually use the fungi, they garden, if you will, in those tunnels and they grow fungi which they eat. And ambrosia is an old uh, fashioned word for fun fungus and so the ambrosia beetles uh, actually take this uh, association, association with fungi to a higher level actually and they grow it on purpose and eat it whereas the other bark beetles uh, there's no conscious involvement with fungi on their part. They just are contaminated with it. Do they have uh, fungi in special um, or organs on their body that, that help introduce the fungus? And it it grows, and we'll talk about what that's all about. But um, in most cases, the fungi association with the beetle is what they call obligate, like it, it must have happened, it occurs in all cases. In other cases there are, are fungi that may or may not be involved that just contaminate the beetle and get introduced, but there's not this intimate relationship. Most of the time with bark beetles it is uh, obligate. Um, it's very complicated. Uh, there's more than one fungus involved for each of these beetles. Uh, some of them are very beneficial to the beetle. Some of them are even antagonistic to the beetle. And you wonder why would a beetle be involved with fungi that aren't particularly good for it. Um, and I think the answer is that there are other components to this whole um, 
association of all these organisms. There's there's mites that are hitchhiking on the body of the uh, beetles, and sometimes these fungi that are not particularly good for the beetle are good for the mites, and then the mites have a benefit to the beetle, and so it's pretty complicated. But when I was in school in the 70s, um, the theory, which I'm calling number one here, that we learned in school was that the fungi introduced into the tree by these bark beetles clogs up the xylem tissue, the water pipes in the tree that take water from the roots up to the top. Uh, this fungus clogs those pipes and the tree is essentially dying of drought. It can't get enough water. And that's what we learned. Um, that's not what they think happens now. Um, theory number two was that everybody suspected or sensed that these trees have defense systems that involve their pitch, their resin, and that somehow the introduction of these fungi disarms that tree's ability to send pitch to the invasion site by the beetles and throw them out or flood them out. Um, that's maybe partly involved, but that's not really thought to be super important now. And theory number three, which um, Dr. Six at Montana State, I believe she's at Montana State, she's the one that seems to have resolved what's really going on, and that is that these fungi uh, benefit the beetle nutritionally. So the fungus is growing in this phloem tissue, having been introduced by the beetle, and it's kind of growing out into the phloem ahead of where the beetle is feeding. And um, it's thought that the presence of the fungi, the fungi start pulling from the substrate around them uh, various nutrients and um, then as the beetle cruises through that enhanced phloem, that kind of, uh, I guess if you're young it's a kind of red bull for a beetle, if you're older it's centrum silver, but uh, the beetles cruising through enhanced phloem that is better than it would have been had the fungi not been present and modifying things. And so once the beetle has proper nutrition from this enhancement by the fungus, then it can actually the, the offspring of the attacking beetles, the, the brood or the larvae can grow outward from where they were the egg was that they started from and they girdle the tree, physically girdle it, mechanical girdling by the tunnels. But the tunnels would not be able to happen without the enhancement of the tissue that they're feeding on by the fungus. So that's that's what we think is going on and I imagine in 10 years or 20 years there's going to be theory number four that explains it even better. But um, uh, it, there's not a lot of research going on right now that I'm aware of in this area, and there should be because it's super important to understanding this whole thing. But um, there are structures on these bark beetles that are called mycangia, and they are anatomical modifications of the body wall, little invaginations or pouches, if you will, that... Um, Different bark beetles have mycangia in different places on the body, around the head or the thorax, uh, even on the abdomen. But depending on the species, uh, they, they all have them, and they are specialized to carry these fungi. So the fungi get inadvertently pushed in there by feeding in these uh, areas, and then when they fly to a new tree, the beetle takes some fungus with them, and uh, there are even glandular, glandular secretions that go into these pouches that are thought to enhance the growth of the fungi, and so it's a highly evolved thing, and this uh, electron micrograph, kind of a slice through a beetle, that's the head at the top, and the mouth is over at the right part, kind of where it says MY, 
um, th that just shows where these mycangia are. Now, bark beetles, obviously their success in attacking a tree is somewhat dependent on the vigor of the host, just like uh, disease organisms that affect us, if we're rested and well-fed, we're less likely to come down with a disease than we are if we're run down and tired and so on. And um, So it's more than just being exposed to the issue, it's you've got to be in the right condition for that uh, organism you're exposed to to take hold. And uh, vigor um, in a tree has a lot to do with its moisture situation. Uh, if it's getting adequate water, not too much, not too little, uh, its resin pressure is proper, adequate, best to fight things off. And um, some of these bark beetles are fairly aggressive. They don't need a host that's in on its last legs for them to be successful. It can just be uh, somewhat stressed, and that might just be from from its age. Um, there are some bark beetles we call secondary, and they require the tree to be in much lower vigor than other than say these primary species, ones we call the primary bark beetles. The pine beetle would be considered a primary attacker. This shows this cartoon shows what can happen. In some cases, it probably happens a lot, and that is that the beetles attack a tree and the tree is healthy enough to actually fend them off and it does so most visibly with uh, producing lots of pitch at the attack points and these are called pitch outs and a lot of times you can find the beetles stuck right in the, the pitch mass at the attack point. But uh, resistance to attack is, is a function of vigor and also uh, conditions of the forest, how close are the trees growing together, how deep is the soil, uh, what's the weather been like in terms of extremes, and then of course the number of attacking beetles is critical to whether the beetle is successful or not. They have to have uh, a critical mass to achieve success and one beetle trying to bring down a big pine tree is going to lose, uh, even that one. And that's the face of a pine beetle, and um, that's what that little beetle can do to a forest. This is an aerial view of a forest here in, along the Front Range of Colorado, just north of Boulder, and um, I took that picture from an airplane, and I can't remember it really looking like that, but it did. And um, we should probably talk about the uh, scientific name of this beetle, the Dendroctinus ponderosi, which if we remembered our Latin from high school, that means dendro, tree, tonus means killer, and what kind of tree do they kill? Ponderosa, pine. They also kill uh, limber pine and po lodgepole pine and a couple other pines that are native to um, our area, like uh, bristle cone and, and maybe even white bark. There might be some white bark there in Montana, but um, and we're finding out they do kill some other pine trees that we plant ornamentally, like pinyon and Austrian and Scotch. Um, so here's the taxonomic setting for this beetle. If you remember how we break down the animal kingdom, it's kingdom, phylum, class, order, family, genus, species. Um, the way I remembered that in school was kitchen patrol, cup of flour, graduating senior. And uh, you can come up with your own little ditty to remember the order. Uh, but this beetle is in the newly assigned to the family Curculionidae, which are the weevils. Uh, it used to be the bark beetles were their own family. Now they're a subfamily of the weevils. And in our area, we have about 120 species of bark beetles, of which the mountain pine beetles won. Um, recently, the genome of the mountain pine beetle was totally figured out, and um, they're four times more variable 
their DNA is four times more variable than ours, which um, allows them to exploit new habitats. And uh, there's some things that are going on with climate change that we're now seeing the range of the mountain pine beetle up in Canada, British Columbia, uh, is spreading eastward into uh, Saskatchewan and Alberta, and they're actually getting into a new kind of pine tree um, that would, if they follow that pine tree all the way back down south, they could end up in uh, Michigan in jack pine, which would be a whole new uh, situation that we've never seen in history before. And I think part of their ability to do things like that is explained by their uh, pretty diverse uh, genome. Um, this is a Colorado perspective, and I really don't know similar facts for the Wyoming and Montana, but so I'll use the Colorado information. But since about '96, I mean, we've lost a lot of trees in our state, three and a half million trees, and um, the typical infestation rate is about 10 trees per acre in an epidemic and so we've there, there could have been or 3.4 million eight million acres and then that could re represent since 96 we could have lost 30 million trees so that's a lot of trees that's a lot of biomass that's a lot of uh, material that we could use in the kind of things that you folks are exploring um, one of the things I used to do in my job is aerial survey, and that's how we get a handle on kind of the size and scale and scope of these infestations, a broad overview, and we draw on maps where the problems are and how big they are, what kind of trees they're affecting, and um, one of the least favorite parts of my job, I must admit, uh, wasn't a joy ride up in an airplane. It was hard work and uh, in some cases sickening. <laughs> Uh, literally, but um, it was a problem that, that's increasing it by this amount and we need funding and so all our jobs dependent on that kind of work I guess, but uh, um, it, it was misunderstood in a lot of cases in that people would look at the maps and think that they could learn something specifically about their property and oh I don't have any or I do have some and it wasn't that precise in a lot of cases a big broad brush overview from a little airplane but this is what it can do um, every tree that's off color in that picture was killed by mountain pine beetle and the different colors probably represent different years of attack with the very light uh, green ones that are just beginning to turn off color green are the currently infested trees and then the older ones are red and then the very old ones are gray. Uh, this beetle has one generation a year. The beetles fly from the trees in midsummer. The so-called parent beetles, the attacking beetles, are the parents of the offspring that will kill that tree. Um, they attack it, lay eggs under the bark, and the brood develops, girdles the tree. The crowns of those trees usually turn color about nine months after their attack. So if they're attacked in August and September, they turn color in May and June of the following year. And uh, we need to keep those kind of dates and, and timetables in mind when we're trying to do management operations. Uh, we have to respect the biological schedule of the beetle in order to be effective if we're going to do management. Um, the beetle looks like that and it's very small and most people are very surprised to find out that this little beetle the size of a raisin is what's killing all these trees and it's a great a testament to the old adage about strength and numbers. You know, 1,500, 2,000 beetles attack a tree at once same afternoon and that's how they're effective. Um, to detect these trees 
we need to walk in the woods and get chest to chest with the trees and look for these external uh, signs and symptoms of the beetle. And one of those um, is called pitch tubes. Every place a beetle attacks, a pair of beetles attacks a reasonably healthy tree, there's a little glob of pitch develops at that point. As they go through the bark, they, their little mandibles are producing little chunks of bark that accumulates at the base of the tree and we call that boring dust. So this picture shows a kind of a halo of tan dust that's created by the beetles going through the bark up above by the hundreds and hundreds of them. Uh, woodpeckers are the main avian predator of bark beetles and they, to get down to their prey, they have to chip the bark off and sometimes you can identify a beetle infested tree by recognizing the characteristic markings that woodpeckers make in trying to chip down with their beak to get their uh, food. And then eventually the needles on the tree turn color, like we said, about nine months after the attack. When the beetles leave that tree, then we have what are called exit holes. So the attacking points have pitch associated with them. The exit holes are dry bullet holes in the bark. So here's what pitch tubes look like. And that's about maybe a 10 inch diameter tree. So you can see the spacing of these attacks. It's not like there's one every inch. It's every couple, three inches is an attack. And underneath each one of those pitch tubes would be the results of two beetles, one male, one female, attacking at that point, laying eggs, and then the larvae developing from that parent pair. So little tiny pitch tubes are usually indicative of successful attacks, real gooey, runny pitch tubes are indicative of maybe the tree having enough defense to push them out. Here's what woodpeckering looks like. These are big patches of bark chipped off where the woodpeckers are using their beaks to get down into that phloem area where the beetle is. So once we have a pretty good idea that this tree might be infested, we need to look under the bark to kind of uh, seal the deal and and make a you know we're marking a tree if this is an area where we're doing intensive management and trying to reduce the beetles we want to make sure we're not cutting trees down that unnecessarily so we need to be certain when we say this is a beetle tree that needs to come out it really does and these homeowners that I worked with are pretty savvy about what it should look like they know about blue stain and they if you mark this tree for removal and a guy cuts it with a chainsaw and that stump is pure white and has no blue stain on it you have some explaining to do um, usually I would say that uh, this is a thinning you know we're just cutting this tree to reduce the competition with nearby trees uh, trying to cover up uh, our mistake but I mean usually you can be pretty certain with looking for these external symptoms and then you do an under the bark check um, if if you have a little bit of experience you can be very accurate in saying this is a tree that's going to die of bark beetles uh, but you have to use a hatchet for that final check and this is what it looks like if we removed a square of bark from an infested tree say this time of year in October, November, that piece is probably a foot and a half wide by two and a half feet high. And you can see those, those long vertical tunnels. If you look closely at those tunnels, you can see two beetles associated with most of those. And those, the top beetle in, the, in each tunnel system is the female and the bottom one is the male and we'll talk about that here but that is a gallery what it, those are called egg galleries or parent galleries so the attack occurs at the bottom of those uh, long lines 
and then the beetle goes upward from that attack point. So the pitch tubes that we saw on the outside of the tree would be right over the top of the bottom of each one of those uh, vertical brown lines. So here's what I call the perfect chop. We, you chop, flick your wrist, and pull off a bark piece about the size of a 3 by 5 card. And you can see the tunnel, the parent gallery, what's called the beetle gallery there. You can see the blue stain. And what you can't see in this picture is when you pull the bark off a tree like that, a lot of the beetles fall out, the larvae, white larvae, or... or other stages of the beetles fall out on the ground as you pull that bark off. So this is maybe uh, six, eight inches wide by a foot tall, this square, and you can see the different, uh, kind of looks like spaghetti at first glance, but with a little practice you can identify what's going on here. So I've got everything labeled. the. The wide vertical gallery is the parent gallery or egg gallery. So the female lays eggs along that gallery as she cruises from the bottom of the page up to the top, maybe lays 100 eggs, and then each egg hatches and makes the larvae that results from that hatch makes the tunnel out to the side uh, perpendicular to the vertical egg gallery. So usually the larval galleries are roughly horizontal. And then you can see in the upper right there kind of a circular area with a white thing in the middle of it. That is a the larva came out, was done feeding, made a pupil cell, the circle, and then transformed within that cell to the pupil stage and then finally to the adult stage. And then when it emerges, it will go out of the bark, kind of away from the surface of the page. So the exit hole would be going away from us as we look at this. And you can see also way over at the right, kind of along the middle edge, there are a little skinny pale thing, a couple of them, and those are the uh, parasites, uh, parasitoids of the bark beetles. There's flies and wasps that uh, get down in that tunnel system and parasitize the beetle. So it does have natural enemies, it's just during ep epidemic conditions, not enough to stop anything. Um, so um, the sex life of the beetle is pretty interesting and um, it involves a lot of uh, things that we all can relate to here. And uh, uh, the first beetles out of a infested tree that are going flying off to start a new infestation are usually the the uh, females, and um, so they're kind of what we call the pioneers. They're the first ones out of the old red trees, and they fly out, and they're trying to find uh, new green trees to set up a new attack. Um, I call my male beetle Buford, and I've come to call the female beetle Bernadette. So let's say Bernadette is the first one out of the tree, and she flies across the valley, and she um, is using mostly visual clues to find another tree, a tree to attack. She's looking for a up and down vertical dark object, which usually corresponds to a trunk. She may accidentally land on a telephone pole or um, some other non-host, you know, the wrong kind of tree. But eventually she finds a big diameter pine tree. And once she chews into it a little bit and determines that it's suitable for uh, attack, then she puts out into the air a, a pheromone, a perfume that attracts other beetles. And this perfume is quite powerful in terms of its effect on other bark beetles of that species. And it doesn't take but one molecule per cubic foot of air to elicit a response from another bark beetle. So let's say Buford's on the other side of the hill 
and he comes out of the tree that he was in, and he happens to gaze out on the big bad world and and senses this wonderful perfume that he knows means uh, food and a virgin. And so he heads off, raises his elytra, his hard wings, and underneath that are the flying wings, and he flies out into the air and he tries to find out where the source of this perfume is. And he is kind of at the whim of the wind and how it directs these molecules, and so he doesn't make a if we could follow him, it would not be a beeline right to Bernadette. It's probably a pretty circuitous route, just like all of us uh, males can relate to when we're trying to find a mate. And uh, um, he lands at the tree. He's found the source, and he's probably, um, if beetles can be excited, he's probably excited. And uh, this is the first time in Buford's life that he's confused, and it won't be the last, because what he sees is Bernadette blocking the front door uh, with her rear end. And he's like, I've worked all morning to find you, and this is what, this is how you greet me. And um, he actually has some vocalizations. We talked about uh, chirps or vocalizations earlier and that these beetles do make noises and uh, the bark beetles in that genus Dendroctinus have three different chirps. So let's say that the first one is um, what's up and that doesn't work very well. Bernadette doesn't move out of the way and so Buford tries his second chirp, which is a uh, nice house, and that doesn't work either. And so number three is, uh, you're beautiful, I'll be gentle. And she moves out of the way and invites him into her little chamber that she's chewed into the bark. And once inside, uh, the, the second confusion Would two bark beetles that are potential mates fight first? And again, maybe some of us can relate to that situation. But um, anyway, uh, <laughs> uh, this is basically a test of fitness. So, are you strong? Are you going to be a good uh, producer of eggs for my children? Uh, a lot of reasons. They're checking each other out and assuming they pass the test, then they mate. Uh, again and again and again, and um, then the third confusion for Buford occurs as Bernadette begins chewing upward from this little chamber that she initially invited him into, which they call the nuptial chamber or the, the mating chamber. She begins to chew upward into the phloem and begins her job of laying eggs and basically buries Buford in her chewing and droppings uh, behind her. So he maybe follows her for a while and she soon out distances him and buries him and and uh, that's the end of it. So he's he's confused. Is that all there is? And pretty much that is all there is. Buford, you're done, dude. And uh, so she completes her development uh, of producing the eggs, maybe 100 eggs, maybe a 12 inches worth of gallery that she constructs straight up from there. And uh, um, the other females are nearby doing the same thing. And as they go up laying eggs, they are also making a sound, which is sort of like uh, if you've been in a situation where there's construction trucks or uh, maybe a, a garbage truck in the alley and it's making a beeping sound to let you know where it is. The, the beetles are making, the female beetles are making chirps so that the other females know where they are and they can kind of space their galleries out which leaves enough room in between the two 
egg galleries, lots of phloem in between, so that the, the offspring have a chance of developing. So it's a pretty complicated, pretty interesting thing. And um, um, so if we look in this picture, how many uh, used and thrown away Bufords do you see? I think I think we counted about five the other day, and they're the lower. Each gallery system has usually has two beetles, and the lower one is is the male. So here's here's a very highly uh, attack tree and pretty much the whole phloem area is used up but it's not so crowded that uh, there's not enough room so you could say that these beetles are smarter than us in, in a lot of ways we, we find somewhere we like and we tend to uh, the Eagles had that line in the song about finding call someplace paradise and you can kiss a goodbye we, we, humans tend to keep pouring into nice places until they're kind of ruined and bark beetles are smarter than that. They shut off the attack uh, when they have enough to overcome the tree so there's a second pheromone involved in these attacks and that is the first one's called the aggregating pheromone the one that female uses to attract other beetles aggregates them once they have achieved the density that they need to kill that tree they shut it off the attraction and they put out a second pheromone called the anti-aggregating pheromone and that limits attacks. There's spillover so this one tree is filled up and the message to the late arrivals is this tree's full, go start your own party and they attack a tree nearby. So when you look up on a hillside and you see the clumpy distribution of these red trees, it's explained by there's one tree in the center of all those patches that was the initial tree and then the spillover results in this uh, kind of clumpy distribution. So this is how a tree would look uh, late in the spring right before maybe early summer before the beetles are going to emerge and you can see a lot of pupae in there in those pupil cells. You can see some light brown uh, what we call callow adults, the light brown kind of really fresh adults that haven't hardened up yet are not ready to emerge uh, they're in there too. So that's the way it looks late in the game under one of these, under the bark of one of these attack trees. So the foliage fades about nine months later. Uh, we talked about these key times in the life cycle. The flight time is in a key time. You know, most of the beetles emerge from dead trees and fly to new trees at about the same time. Within two, three weeks, that's when that all happens. So there's millions, billions of beetles in the air during this flight time period in these heavily infested areas. And, um, uh, you know, I imagine to, beetle, to birds that eat the beetles, um, they probably have got their fill of bark beetles during these events because it's, it's kind of an all or nothing thing. You don't see any bark beetles out in the air and then for, for a month there in late summer, they're they just pour out of the trees and attack a new set. So mountain pine beetle management can be basically broken into two, uh, two areas, prevention and suppression. And prevention can be either silvicultural, we can modify the forest, the silvic, the silvics, uh, the, the density of trees in the stand, uh, the age of the trees, spacing, we, we can manage that with cutting activity called thinning, or we can chemically prevent tree, uh, trees from being attacked with pesticides. And, uh, you know, if you have a resort in Yellowstone or um, a very expensive house with four trees around it that you just cannot afford to let nature take its course, you, if those four tree, trees were kill that would really change things, then chemical preventive spraying may be the artificial answer to keeping those trees alive, even if there's a lot of bark beetles around. Then the suppression techniques down there at the bottom, that involves actually you're not saving any trees, you're, you're trying to cut down trees in a timely way and do something to them so that the beetles developing in those trees can't fly and kill other trees. It's very difficult to do and, and requires 
a lot of uh, people being on the same page and with the same goals, which doesn't seem to happen anymore in human society. We, nobody's on the same page with, if you got more than two people, you got disagreement. Um, thinning, that's a stand of trees that has been thinned. The prescription is to reduce its susceptibility to bark beetles, so it still looks pleasant, it's still beautiful, but about every other tree had, has been removed from the natural stand and um, you know foresters have measurements that they take to figure out how much how many trees to remove and in what spacing and uh, basically about every other tree is a pretty good prescription in most cases. But this shows the rings of a tree and you can see at the left part there the rings are very close together the tree was thin and then the tree did what we call release it began to grow well again it had more space more sunshine more nutrients and uh, with the removal of some competition competing trees it it grew much faster and those big ring growth trees are much more likely to be able to push out the beetle when they attack than the the, the very close rings, the struggling trees, slow growing trees. Um, preventive spraying is done in high value situations so this this house in the middle of a pine forest, those are the kind of places where a lot of preventive spraying occurs. Um, that's what it looks like. Uh, it does involve pesticides, a lot of questions about uh, safety and to the sprayer to the environment to birds to water it all has to be done right um, and these are some techniques I think you're gonna all have access to this uh, talk so I'm not going to go through each one of these but uh, all those things are done in some areas to reduce you know they try to identify all the infested trees and deal with them somehow to prevent the beetles from emerging to kill other trees uh, these are agents that naturally regulate the population. Uh, obviously woodpeckers, hairy woodpeckers, the main one in the Rocky Mountains, but there are some other ones, the three-toed woodpecker. Um, and then these, this beetle at the bottom with the uh, orange body is the, called a clarid beetle. They're very important. Uh, Trogocytid beetles or ostomids, they're also called over on the right. And then these little flies. They all regulate the population, but when the forest condition is right for an epidemic, these things kind of lose their hold and the epidemic occurs. Um, from a biodiversity standpoint, uh, I, as an entomologist, would have a lot more fun with that left tree finding different creatures than the right tree. There's a lot more life in terms of diversity, different kinds of insects and in that left tree and that's why we said earlier the pine beetle is truly a, a keystone species. It does result in uh, habitat for a lot of other creatures. So salvaging these trees um, is probably the proper thing to do in a lot of areas. In some areas it probably shouldn't be done. Uh, wilderness areas and areas that are left to just let natural processes happen. I don't think it would be appropriate but in a lot of these areas because of the tree falling is an issue in terms of taking out power lines or falling on houses, crossing trails. Um, if those are areas where we can not allow natural uh, succession to occur, then we might as well use those trees for energy and I think that's where your group comes in. Um, so it's not easy getting dead trees out of the woods in large numbers and um, but it has been done and I, I think it we haven't done it in enough places. We ought to be heating our schools with pine beetle wood and, uh, we ought to be doing a lot of things with that wood, I think. Um, so th this slide was put together mostly in talking to people who go up in the mountains to cut firewood and sometimes they cut firewood that's full of beetles and bring it down to somewhere 
in town. They don't get it all burned up and the beetles fly and kill trees in town. So we need to cut trees that are safe and um, so this was put together to kind of convince people dry wood's easier to burn than green wood. Dry wood is much less likely to harbor bark beetles. They've already come and gone from those kind of trees than the green infested trees have. Um, that's what exit holes look like and I usually tell people if you want to cut a tree down and move it somewhere, store it at the sawmill or in your backyard, it should have exit holes all over it which means the beetles have left that tree and it's safe to transport. Uh, so BB is bark beetle, so if it has bark beetle evidence and no exit holes, it could be dangerous to move that kind of wood around. Uh, bark beetle evidence but exit holes, okay. Uh, and bark beetle evidence could be pitch tubes, boring dust, woodpeckering, maybe the tree crown is red, or you found the life stages under the bark. Uh, I would say if you're cutting firewood, you should probably use a hatchet to make sure the the wood you're going to cut isn't infested before you go moving it around. Um, so here's just some some numbers about salvage typical tree and how many how much energy we could get from that. So there's the aftermath of an infestation, and there's a lot of wood there that could decay and the carbon end up being another pine tree on that site. Uh, I don't think we should haul all of that stuff off. We should leave some of that dead wood on site, but uh, certainly we could take some out of there and do some more planting and uh, kind of hasten the creation of the new forest. But this is succession and I think it's a beautiful thing and we pine beetles part of it, but uh, uh, anyway, thank you for what you do as teachers and I hope this was helpful to you.